really got a character full face. That's got a person's face, hasn't it? We're here at last after our mini pub lunch break. Just liquid nourishment, a y thing. He's doing well, the Stellas. He's coming on all right. He looks so calm. Overnight stop. Not sure about the double bed situation. <laughs> <laughs> in the morning, we'll go and collect our cracking little baby snakes we've come to get. Look at this. We're a few miles from Exeter. We're in a beautiful old churchyard. Lovely views. But look at this for a reptile hotspot. We've got corrugated sheeting. We've got a compost heap, perfect for slow worms and grass snakes for laying their eggs in. And we've got a rubble pile, superb hibernaculum. It's kind of reptile haven just in one part of a churchyard. And we've got a bit of sunshine. And despite there being adders, grass snakes and common lizards in this churchyard, according to what I've read. There's none out today that we can see, but what a lovely old churchyard. Peace, quiet, and they can be some absolute perf perfect or perfection for British wildlife of all kinds. How wonderful. Just off the M5, when you're in tranquil countryside. Lovely. Well, we've had our overnight stop. Very nice of us too. Uh, we've driven a short way across Exeter to meet a really lovely guy called Chris. He's got a lovely collection of real cracking, beautiful, really healthy looking reptiles in some lovely naturalistic setups. It's also got some really nice and usual animals. And we've picked up our snakes, mystery snakes. We'll tell you what they are when we unbox them later on. So we've just got done on a speed camera ahead of us. And we're now heading across to see our great friends at the Dorset Falconry Park. Who we keep promising to see and see their amazing place that they've been setting up. Join us in the rest of this little vlog and see what they've got going on over there. lunch at a lovely village pub. Now we've just got seven miles to go until we get to the Dorset Falkery Park and hopefully we'll get an interview from Martin and Tara as to what made them want to set up a Falkery Park, a nature race zoo. Is it education? Is it a lifelong passion? we would be interested to see what made them go through all they've had to do to set this wonderful place up for really us guys to go and visit. Still 
teeth, a bit of a flecking in, in, in the head. Anyway, whatever. some of them yeah. will go absolute pure, pure white. He's doing well, the Stellas. He's coming on, alright. Do you see the other vlogs? Hello, T Martin. Uh, he is a she, Sorry. so well done, Dave. We're here at last after our mini pub lunch break. Don't tell everybody. We're here at the Dorset Falkery Park with Martin and his gorgeous girls. Elsie. Elsie. And Connie. And it's I, very windy. It's very windy. <laughs> Hopefully, you can hear us. What I want to know is we've had a walk around. This place is stunning. It's seven acres of not just birds of prey, wild ponds, flying areas, orchards, beautiful vegetable gardens, a tea room, all built by this guy and these guys, amazingly hard work and fair hands. What I want to know, because I know it's cost an absolute fortune, we know from our own experience, why are you guys interested in birds of prey and wildlife? Why would you put yourself through this when all of you could do something for a lot more money a lot easier. <laughs> Why have you gone from doing displays and school education to for building a, this I think, place? I think one of the biggest things that I say all the time when I'm doing presentations and stuff, um, one of the key things about the bird of prey side of things is teaching people as much as not just what the birds do, but what they don't do. And that's to cancel out the persecution that we still see with regards to birds of prey and some of our British birds of prey, which I've got a great passion for. One of my favorite birds of prey are these common kestrels, What's which common, are not so common now. When we were kids, it we, was the only one, wasn't you know, it? We do our bit, we've got some wild disabled kestrels that we breed from each year, and I hack them back into the wild. They're BTO leg run by my, my amazing vet, Brilliant. who's yeah. also a BTO ringer. Um, but it's also, uh, it's inspiring the youngsters. These are the future. That's, that's the and one, yeah. somewhere out there is the next Attenborough or the equivalent of. Absolutely. And I think it's our job to nurture that, inspire that, um, to make sure that, that, that somewhere out there, the, the passion for wildlife. And it's not just a bird of prey center, as you've seen. Um, the girls got me massively into the butterflies, which is why it's to build a beautiful big butterfly garden. Like me, um, you're still learning, aren't you? I'm but learning. All, what was that one yesterday out in the meadow? A clouded yellow. Oh, uh, and my favourite one, the brimstone, which yeah. I still can't photograph because it's so fidgety and moves all the time. Um, we've seen great grass snakes here. We've got the newts here. The bats. What are the? Tell me what the bats. Brown long The brown long eared bats, bats that we get here now. They come flying around the, the, the mews here. Um, the pipistrels are out there in good numbers. We've put up loads of bird boxes and every single one got used, including my collection box, <laughs> uh, which is quite amazing. Uh, that was great tits. Um, so, and it's also teaching people that having birds of prey doesn't scare away wildlife. It's part of nature, part of food, part of food chains. And, um, you know, if we can have all of these in our ecosystem, and that's what we use our birds as kind of ambassadors to, to inspire no, young and old. If you can inspire these kids here, um, you like falconry, but you actually turn out you like fishing. Both of these guys, and any one or any children, if you love one aspect of nature or a countryside living, you'll begin to learn about and appreciate so much else, won't you? If you learn about kestrels, that will broaden so fast, won't it? Absolutely. Into other birds of prey in the natural world. You know, and it's great that um, we've had lots and lots of, of, of youngsters coming in that said, I saw a hobby the other day. Yeah. How many people have heard of a hobby because we get them over here? Um, and then they see, you know, my girls, Elsie and Connie. Who's your favourite bird to fly? Shout it out. Robin the Hooded Vulture. Robin the Hooded Vulture, a critically endangered species. But just and like Icarus, we really want to champion those absolutely, vultures that way. Absolutely, and, and obviously your favourite bird? Kipper the Kestrel. Is this one because she trained it. Um, so you know, this so young lady, no she's already training birds of prey. Fantastic. And sadly, there's not many children that can say that, are there? And no, it's because of no. people like these, people like these, people like us, going into schools, meeting the public on a daily basis. We're lucky we can give those kids an opportunity to get involved in something that maybe their parents have got no interest in or don't know about. So we're teaching the animals, but we're sparking that spark, isn't it? It's a real about it spark. It is sparking, you know, it's igniting 
uh, the, the, the interest and making sure that passion and also I think from what we do with, with Bird of Prey demonstrations, um, I see it a lot and you must see it a lot when young, young boys or young girls, um, they don't say about, oh, I like birds and wildlife because it might be a bit nerdy or uncool. And then they see us going out there like mad things, flying these amazing eagles and vultures, and then the youngsters like coming out and they see how cool it actually yeah, is. Actually and that's what it. we've got to do to turn turn the favour. That's that's why we do what we do. It's a fantastic place. The Dorset Falkery Park, if you're in the UK, any time, if you're over here from overseas or you're just travelling around the UK, come and see these guys. This place is morphing and evolving on a daily basis. So much more carpentry skills this bloke's going to learn. <laughs> so much more housing to build. But I just want to end on, can you tell me what kind of animal a tench is? They're a fish. They're a fish. What's its Latin name? Tinker Tinker. Tinker, Tinker. Tinker. We learn new stuff every day. <laughs> Hope you've enjoyed the vlog. <laughs> Wanna hold it? No. Wanna hold it? Just let it wiggle over your fingers. Right. Be brave. It's only got a little Don't drop him. Don't drop him. Hey! Can I have a little time? No, it won't hurt you. Think of the pain that pestle could cause you when you get the talons. This can't hurt you at all. It's so much fun. I'll wait for you. Just feel it. Honestly, it feels nice. Put your hand down. Yeah. Yeah. Just let it, just let it go over you. Snake's going to love you. So what home? I've got some. Snake. I've got some baby snakes this big. And what's this? A little black, yellow and red stripes. If you want one. It's a, is that Cinnamon? Pueblans. Pueblans. Pueblan milk snakes. I've got 30 of them and 20 more really? to hatch. Okay, go. So we got home late from our snake odyssey adventure. And we've had a good old nap and a sleep. Spent the morning up at a falconry centre, cleaning out enclosures. I spent the afternoon in a reptile house, cleaning out enclosures. Finally, let's unbox these mystery snakes that we went to get. So they came from a place near Exeter, from a guy called Chris. What a legend Chris is. He actually pretty much revamped and reset properly up the reptile centre at Twycross Zoo back in 1973. I was one then. So this guy's been around reptiles pretty much forever. He had some gorgeous European stuff, all kinds of really unusual rare rat snakes, geckos I've never seen before. Let's have a look at what we went down there for that he bred. These were ordered pre-lockdown before March 2020 because I was told this is the guy to go to for this kind of snake. We bought a trio, hopefully a male and two females. The females are unrelated. Here's your final clue, your only clue. These snakes are Britain's fourth species of wild snake, living and breeding in the wild. But they're not native. What are they? Let's have a look. So this is one of the females, which is a dark face. And you'll see what I mean when you see the normal looking ones. Or rather the more normal phase. These are not morphs, these are wild. They're not wild. These are wild phases, not colour morphs. Not bred colour morphs. So does it look like a very pale baby grass snake? But it's certainly no natrix. Pop this one away. Let's look at the other two. The species is going to grow to about two metres long. Semi arboreal, good climbers. I know some of you know what it is already. Well, he knows. Let's have a look at this one. These are not grass snakes, these are no natrix species. And yet, look at this. Look at that neck collar, yellow neck collar. You would think, well, that's got to be some sort of baby grass snake. But it's not. Technically, what we call a kind of rat snake. 
European species. There's three wild populations in the UK. And you can see this is the more normal colouring with that lovely yellow neckband. And this pattern will change a little bit as they grow up. Here's another clue. They're kind of named after one of the Roman. Oh, look at that feisty blighter. One of the Roman goddesses, if you like. Oh, they're feisty of medicine. Let's check out the other one. Make sure he's okay before we put them in their quarantine enclosures. He stayed there, but he got to go in there for a couple more minutes. This one's a feisty one for sure. You guess what species they are, yeah? There's nothing in here. This year's hatchling Asculapian snakes. Revered by the Romans and linked with a goddess Asculapius. So long thought to be linked with medicine. Why have we got them? Because remember, one thing we want to get into moving forward is outside enclosures in the UK for our reptiles and amphibians that can live there. And this European species, perfectly suited for semi-arboreal, they can climb, outdoor enclosure. After all, there's two populations in Wales and a population living wild in London. If they can live there, they can live here in a nice sunny spot for sure. Absolutely beautiful snakes. But of course, when you go to see someone a little bit legendary in the herptile breeding world, you're going to see lots of stuff that these people have bred this year that you're going to really fancy. And of course, you know how it is. So just check out a little bonus purchase. Another European snake species. Let's find the prettiest one. Maybe this one. These are really beautiful species of European snake, and that one is feisty. Look at these. Excuse the state of my hands, they're ravaged by work. European leopard snakes. These ones are nearly a year old. And they grow to a lovely snake, about the size of a corn snake. And certainly something much different to now what is becoming a bog standard animal, the corn snake, almost a truly domestic snake. Leopard snakes, captive bred here in the UK. Wonderful, wonderful pets. And a wonderful species to own. And again, perfectly suited to outdoor enclosures. Look at that, absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous animal. Beautiful patterns. Check back when these guys are growing bigger. Hope you enjoyed this week's vlog. It's been a lovely road trip. We've met some fantastic people along the way. We've had a mini break. We actually had a night away, which is not easy these days. And we've come, oh, <laughs> and we've come home with some stunning snakes that hopefully in the wild and wild in the future years will breed for us and that's all about conservation furthering the species in captivity and the pleasure for us to own watch study thanks for watching like and subscribe